day, Paul. First of all, let me thank you for agreeing to do this video interview with me today over Zoom. Okay, that's great to be here. Thanks for, for inviting me up. You're most welcome. Um, I've got a four-part introduction here before we get into the meat of things. And so my first question for you is, can you tell us a little bit about where you grew up? Well, where I, well I grew up in New Zealand, so probably a little different to most of the people you have on your podcast. So uh, I come from that far-flung land um, on a little farm and uh, a near a village that used to have a horse until the horse left. So... So the rural part of New Zealand. Well, thank you. So tell us a little bit about your schooling and where did you go to school and what did you study? Um, well, a little local village school to start with, which was interesting because there was like 50 pupils there and two classrooms. And so you did all the work in classroom one. And when you'd done that, you went to classroom two, regardless of what age you were. And then you sat with the people who were doing maths or English or whatever at the same level you were. Again, whatever the ages were. So uh I ended up leaving there really quite young, going on to secondary school, much younger than sort of anybody else. And I have to apologize because that's my phone and I should have turned it off. <laughs> that's okay. It's the modern era. So what, when did you go to university and what, what, did, what was your focus there? Um, I went to, went to college. Uh, yeah, sorry about the phone. I really, uh, sorry about that. Um, yeah, I went to college in the local town and uh, then went to university, did a couple of years, dropped out, <laughs> quite frankly, spent four years working around doing all sorts of different stuff on farms as a mechanic, as this and that, and then went back to university and got an engineering degree, which was uh, very, which is great, and then spent some time being an engineer, doing all sorts of interesting stuff. Wow, that's, uh, it was, um, many of my mentors, my heroes, no longer with us for the most part, were engineers. And I just find that fascinating that they made their way into first instruction and then a performance orientation to instruction. But uh, so tell us, where do you live and work now? Um, well, I'm living in the middle of Kent in the southeast of England on a farm, which is great being back to my roots. So I've still got tractors and chainsaws to play with and dogs and cats and um, and so on, so and, and machinery, so all good for that. Um, and I, I work largely from home, so um, I I operate as a consultant, but also I've got my own software company um, for niche learning software. So we've got a platform that we sell out into uh, the UK public sector and other places, um, some international, but not so much, mostly in the UK. Okay, great. Well, thank you. So now I'd like to cover the ground from when you got out of school to where you are right now. So can you kind of take us through your career progression? Where did you go after school as an engineer? What did you do? You know, and and, and let's just walk through the whole progression to find out how did you get to where you are today? Um, progression is a grand word for what was just a whole sequence of happenstances that it's that lovely song, you know, life, you know, uh, you know, life happens when you're making other plans. And uh, I'm not sure I had a plan. I very much just went from this to that. Um, and uh, yeah, so I, as I said, I worked for a while uh, as an engineer in New Zealand, designing and working on it with a big farm machinery company. And uh, then I left and I traveled the world for many, many years, actually, and working here and there and all over the different place, sometimes as an engineer, sometimes as Worked on a fishing trawler off Canada, for example, for a while, you know. So a very eclectic background in lots of different parts of the world. Um, and um, at one point, I ended up uh, working on a big construction site in the UK as a site engineer. And this was big, huge um, roadstone uh, quarry for, for crushing roadstone and, and getting all of that together. And I was a site manager for a big improvement project they had running. Um, <clears throat> but what was interesting is I worked there alongside uh, a Swedish company and they quite liked the cut of my jib. So they made me an offer I couldn't refuse. And uh, I ended up uh, getting offered a job out in Kuwait, working with them, installing turbines and power stations and stuff like that. So some quite big machinery. Um, and uh, about a week before I was due to fly out, uh, Maggie Thatcher, uh, the then Prime Minister of the UK, bless the socks, 
sent some fiberglass um, hulled minesweepers into the Gulf of Hormuz during the Iraq-Iran war. And so they decided uh, that they wouldn't extend their Kuwaiti business. And so I didn't get a job after all out there. Um, so I guess in some frustration, I was walking around London and I walked into an office of Encounter Overland, which is one of the Overland Expedition Companies, which my, my brother had been on a trip with them. And I recognized the name. And I just said, oh, get me out of here. And I got it talking to them. And I ended up actually working for them for uh, uh, four and a half years as an expedition leader which got me all over the world. I ended up crossing the Sahara three times and the Himalayas like eight times and got into all sorts of amazing places uh, with tourists on these adventure expeditions. Um, so fascinating time. Quite fascinating, yes. So I wanted to shift into your books, your series of books, three books. But But so how did you come about to becoming an author with that the focus of those books so wherever you want to start how did you get into the whole learning thing um well i i when i finished that work in hindsight that stuff i did on those expeditions was kind of where i really encountered performance technology in a very loose way it's, it's really interesting as i reflect back and um but I left there and, and, and again, worked as an engineer and did different things and uh, ended up actually um, doing some training. And I quite liked the idea of teaching and training and, and working with people to enable them to do things they weren't previously able to do. Uh, and as part of that, uh, ended up um, working part time as a, as, a, as a trainer in a big a big organization, uh, and and uh, I, I just thought that hey, this this training thing is broken. It it is really broken, um, and that would have been in oh I don't know mid nineties something like that. Um, so you know for a time scale thing, and looking at it as an engineer, if I was an engineer building machinery with that level of failure rate, I'd be killing my customers on a regular basis. And I thought that's that's not good, you know. <laughs> Um, so that's and so I got really interested in in a problem there, um, and that's and I and I like the idea of of working with people. Uh, people came back to me afterwards and say, of all the training courses I've been on, the manual I got from you on your course is the only one I've still got on my desk. And so I thought there must be something I'm doing that's different. That um, and so that that's kind of where I got into it to be honest. And then I just got into more consultancy work, um, got into all things uh, psychology-wise, did a whole bunch of training in that area, which was interesting and fascinating for me um, and different. And I got involved with training and uh, therapy and hypnosis and all sorts of stuff like that in terms of just how the human mind worked and what went on. And um, so, yeah, so there's this huge background of all these different things that, that sort of came together and, and got me into the learning space. And I started actually looking, well, how can I convert those workbooks I did for those training courses into something online? Because that's when online was starting to really do something and developed a product based on that. Um, and that's when it got me into the software side of it. Since then, that product is sort of end of life and has been for a few years now. But it's moved me on and I've built other things uh, software-wise in learning and development. Um, so, yeah, so there's a bit of a progression there, but it's it's interesting how all these different things from engineering to traveling the world with people who'd never been to those sorts of places before and watching how they reacted and interacted with new experiences um, and uh, and the stuff around, you know, how the mind works and so on just – yeah, so it's been a, a, a lot of things pushing together. Um, and as part of that, I wrote the first book on informal learning because um, that's kind of where my head was at at the time. Um, somebody read it and told me there's 50 case studies in there. I never counted them, but anyway. <laughs> um, and then uh, I wrote a second book on sort of performance consultancy and the performance sort of diagnostics process of if somebody asks for training, well, what do you do then? How do you manage that conversation? And I know you've posted a lot of stuff about that as well. Um, and, uh, and and this 
it's really from my experience as an engineer going to a customer saying, well, we need to build this thing. And then you have conversations with them and they, they have this delight of talking about design thinking here in learning and development. Hell, I did that at engineering school 40 years ago or more. You know, there's nothing new about these five steps. Um, so there's that. And then um, I wrote the, the third book on, on sort of learning transfer because uh, and I termed that the elephant in the room because it's something that people kind of nod at occasionally, but usually don't do anything much about it. They're too comfortable doing the traditional delivery stuff. Um, and so I, I sort of started calling that the elephant in the room. And then I realized my first two books were elephants as well. So I've been writing about elephants for years and never knew it. So, uh, Well, I, I, I feel books. so... Uh encouraged and and uh, correct for having chosen you because the things that you've posted um told me that we were you know our spirits were uh in alignment and uh -huh. i didn't know anything about your background but i but i find this very fascinating so thank you for uh, bringing us to that point but um and i wanted to get cover your book so i will put the url for your books in the show notes for the youtube video and then i'm going to do a blog post okay. thank moment. you that's have that time. as well yeah. i mean i just want them to be out there helping people it's you know it, it's yes and 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 i love the fact that it's going to be from basically an engineer's perspective on this because very much so one, you know, one I, of the I, things i would I, say to my clients is that oh. i i come at this more as an engineer would and I have a process that's a, a kind of an engineering process versus what I see too often is an artist colony approach where everybody is doing their own thing, their own way, and it's not predictable. And so I thought that, yeah. that this is what you would bring to us. And I'm sorry to have interrupted you. No, no, that's okay. It's, it is it is it is very much an engineering sort of approach that, you know, it, you've got to get creative but actually it's got to work. There's a bunch of laws that you've got to, laws of physics, if nothing else, for an engineer. You've, there's some things that are immutable that you have to sort of line up with. Um, and and you've got to look at what works, what's desired by the customer. You know, there's no point in gold plating the taps if all they want is a tap. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so on and so forth. So it's really getting clarity on the outcomes for the end user, the customer, and so on. So we and we have the same approach to our software here. You know, it's very much learner centric. The learner has got to be in the middle of it, and mm -hmm. um, you know. Well, let's let me. That's a good segue into my uh, next uh, question, which is, uh, I wanted to know a little bit about your first exposure to what uh, I call and others call HPT, Human Performance Technology, which has been known over the years. Uh, at my professional society and others as as human performance improvement or just performance improvement or just performance technology. Um, so, so you kind of mentioned it in your previous uh, answer to my first set of questions, but when did you first discover that there was this thing uh, that basically, unlike uh, the quality movement and total quality management, does, comes out of the instructional space the training or learning space so who where did you come across this i i'm not sure at a specific point in time as such but when i reflected back on this and i did this a few years ago i was thinking well where does a lot of this come from and it actually comes i think from the overland expedition stuff i did strangely enough and the reason for that is up to that point when I started that, my take on the world and learning and development was pretty much the same as everybody else's at the time, which was if you want to develop or learn, go get another degree or, or you know, something of that ilk. Um, go get another qualification, go do some do some study and sit some exams, and then you're going to be better. Um, which up to a point, you know, has some validity. Um, but during the uh the the program, it, I mean, the example is, is, you know, I would pick up 20 people in London with a four-wheel drive truck and drive them to Nairobi and four months later deliver them. And then I'd get 20 more at Nairobi Airport and drive them back to London, you know, four months later. So we're dealing with people here who have never been in those situations. It's the first time they've been in the bush, the first time they've heard a lion in the wild, the first time they've built a campfire, the first time they've, hell, they've had to go and have a dump in the woods, you know, and, and <laughs> seriously. Yeah. Um, 
So, and they've got to go and draw water from a well. They've got to go to a local market and barter for some some tomatoes and and something else that you know, to cook up for dinner. They've got to light a fire to actually cook the dinner. They've got to put a tent up. They've got to put a mosquito net up. And all of these things they've never ever done before. And it was fascinating watching how people changed over the course of those two or three months as they were exposed to new experiences where they had to make new decisions to deal with what they were being faced with at the time. So the context was such they had to learn and learn fast. So they were having constant new experiences. Um, and each time they had one, they learned something. And they were getting evidence from themselves. So in terms, they'd have to practice putting a tent up after perhaps being shown how to do it. They'd experiment with different ways to do it. Some of them worked, some of them didn't. Sometimes the tent fell over. They were trying to take shortcuts. Um, they'd put a mosquito net up. If they got it wrong, they'd get mosquito bites at night. They soon learned how to do it right. You know, So uh, it's a lot of things that people learned. And I talked to a few of them on the trip and said they were writing diaries. And I said, ah, you're writing in your diary every day, sometimes for an hour, they would sit and write. And I said, do you keep a diary at home? Some of them did. And I said, did you write in there as often? Oh, no, once a week, once a month, maybe, because not that much new happens to be bothered putting in a diary. So the new experiences was what was generating the speed of learning and the speed of change in those people and the speed of development. And it was, I remember there was one um um, a young lady, I don't know if she would have been mid-20s, came on one of the trips. She was actually uh, from New York, I remember. Her name was uh, Julie. And she uh, worked in a, in a, in a publisher. Um, and she would read manuscripts that were inbound to see if they would be worth passing on to an editor and so on to, to, to be worth that publisher taking a closer look at. And that was her day. And she was something of a mouse, in the sense of her personality, very quiet. Um, and um, it was just on the very first sort of time we stopped at a swimming hole, it was, but I didn't bring a bathing suit. I didn't do this. I don't know. I can't swim. And, I, and yet within a couple of months after numerous stops, she was there with a T-shirt jumping off a waterfall, you know. And so the development that was visible in these people as they went through experiences, and I think that's where I started to, in hindsight, think about experiences as the things that change people, as the things that develop people. And so if you want people to change and develop and grow, you need to give them experiences, not just a bunch of knowledge or content. So I think, so I, I kind of went back. So that was my introduction to it, although at the time I didn't realize that was what was going on. But in hindsight, that's what I saw then. Can you... Uh... Talk a little bit about any formal things that you might have read related to learning experiences and such, any articles or books, as a way to point our audience to some of the things that you thought were influential and and perhaps worthwhile for new people to look at. Um, off the top of my head, not really. Um, that's I'd have to go back to my notes and all sorts of things where I was researching and studying for my you know to write the books I wrote. Mm -hmm. I could say go read, you know, the books I wrote, obviously, but that's and there's a, whole, <laughs> there's a whole bunch of stuff on my website that's just free to go and grab and videos to, for people to watch. There's this, you know, there's the two different two websites that you can put in your notes that people can go to and they just take what they want. There's a bunch of free stuff on there that hopefully is useful. Um, but no, there's nobody I sort of follow as such. But th there are names that pop up on LinkedIn and other places, your good self, for example, and some others who I say, oh, yeah, that, that's a name that I, I respect what they have to say and I will go read it. Um, but I'll read anything. Um, but I'm also disappointed. A lot of the time, I'll admit, when I read posts that people put up that are either very self-serving or very narrow in their view or um, haven't really developed an idea and a logical way perhaps that's the engineering in me i just i want to see that logic progression from step one through to step five mm -hmm. so rather than just say do step five i would rather tell people this is probably where you are now here are the steps you need to take or that you can think through as a thought experiment even just that to get to step five now this is why you should be doing step five rather than just say 
do step mm-hmm. five without any kind of logical philosophy or, or progression and, and to get there. Well, great. Thank you for that. I, I agree. Um, so uh, I've got a, a little quiz here or test for you. And that is, if you were to give a 30 second elevator speech, or I guess in England, you might call it a lift. I'm not sure how the phrase goes then, but we call it an elevator speech back here in America. But yeah. so what's your 30 second elevator speech on what you currently do? Ooh. Um, I focus on helping people and enabling better performance through learning and behavior change. I suppose that's key. And either as a consultant with L&D team, so I will work with that, um, or through the learning workflow platform that I have built or alongside um, you know, my team here, obviously. Um, so, yeah, so that's, that's really – so, the, yeah, the software and, and, and stuff, I, I really get a kick out of the, the, the software side of things and what that's possible and how it can scale things for people. Well, thank you. So let me shift gears again here a little bit. As a lifelong learner, where is your current focus or next focus in learning? And are you doing any writing about that that uh, we can point our audience to? Um, Well, I'm writing for magazines and things, you know, on a fairly regular basis and uh, little bits on LinkedIn. I do a weekly tip, um, which goes out to uh, quite a large uh, mailing list and people are very welcome to subscribe to that. Um, Every second week, there's a learning and development tip tip and the other weeks it's sort of a personal development tip so uh, I've been writing those for 12 years now um, so there's quite a library of them and uh, they can see the uh, some of the backlog on my websites and stuff um, I'm not writing any more books I figure three is enough for a trilogy unless you're Douglas Adams of course that's a different story um, he wrote the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Universe and I think he had five books in his trilogy as he called it so um, <laughs> But the focus now, I think it's more I'm looking sector specific. I'm doing quite a bit of work in the health sector at the moment, um, which is fascinating uh, in terms of assisting them develop um, and then do observational assessment of, of things like clinical skills and so on. So um, so the, the, the focus and the focus really is on this sort of learning workflow concept I've uh, been espousing as a way of promoting and delivering behavior change. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, My next question is about language, terminology and such. And is there (laughs) a performance or learning term or phrase that you would like to define for us? Because perhaps you feel it's being misused or misconstrued and you just want to put your own spin on it. But do you have a word or phrase for us that you would define? Um. Well, there's a, there's a couple that fits in that. I, I use the term learning workflow um, as opposed to learning in the flow of work. And I think those are, those are two quite separate things in my mind. And I think learning in the flow of work is quite commonly used. I think it was Josh Burson started. He was the first one to kind of talk about that in a, in a, in a, in a big way. Um, and I think it's a wonderful concept and, and the idea is very sound that we bring learning as close as we can to the point of application. Um, what I've developed here with our software is what I call a learning workflow. So if you want someone to change their behavior to do different things or do things differently, then you are going to have to give them a sequence of experiences over time to accomplish that. Some of those experiences might well be consuming a bit of e-learning or some content, but there'll also be reflection experiences. There'll be experimentation. There will be um, collaboration, talking with others, observing others, uh, practice, and then some more practice, and then some more practice again, if it eventually wants to be the way that they just automatically do that thing, whatever it is. Um, And for me, a design sequence of activity spread over a period of time is a workflow. So if we're going to talk about a workflow for behavior change uh, that incorporates learning, then learning workflow is sort of a, um, a thing that you can design and build to take people through a process to get to behavior change. And that's very different to learning in the flow of work, uh, which is something you're doing as you're going along, sometimes informally, sometimes formally, depending on the, you know, performance support system you've got in place and things like that. Um, And then the other one that I've I've coined actually is a behavioral needs analysis or a BNA. We've got learning needs analysis and training and all these other ones. And 
I think they missed the point. If we need people to behave differently in order to do things better, then we need to think, focus on, well, what behaviors do we need? So hence the behavioral needs analysis or BNA, that's where it's got to start um, as part of that performance consultancy process and figuring out, well, what's going wrong? Why aren't the behaviors we want coming through consistently? Um, what's getting in the way of those? So that's that whole performance consultancy of looking at the individual, the actor, and looking at the stage on which they're performing. How can we bring those two things together so the actor and the stage will um, coalesce and enable that person to be capable at the point of work? That's one of Gary Wise's phrase, by the way, at the point of work. I love it. So I borrowed that from Gary. Mm. Um, so, um, yeah, so there's, but it's that behavioral needs analysis and that gives you an endpoint of that's what we want to see in maybe six months. I want to see this set of behaviors and this is how I would know when I see them. So that gives you then a sense of how to measure your progress towards them. So they've got to have observable criteria on when that behavior exists or not. Um, and then you back off from that. And the question then becomes, how do I deliver those behaviors? Which is a very different question to what most L&D people do, which is how do I deliver this content or curriculum? So how do I deliver this behavior completely changes your approach to the design process. And Good, thank you. I think, so that, that's why I think it's really important to think about doing that behavioral needs analysis and then working backwards from that. Mm -hmm. So let, uh, I want to shift back into uh, to, for our audience and uh, to help point them in uh, directions of uh, people or books or articles that you think might be helpful. We've talked a little bit about this and you've mentioned a couple of names, but, but is, are there people... Uh, who you've uh, begun to explore or study or learn from more recently that you would point our audience to? I think um, some of the ones I've been uh, trying to think of their names now, I'm, I'm reading a lot more on AI. Inevitably, it's going to be a factor in what we do and how we do it. I'm using it myself for some stuff, and I'm finding it useful. Um, I'm fascinated with where that might go. Um, I attended a, um, or spoke at a conference just last week, actually, and the keynote for that conference was a lady called Philippa Hardman, and um, um, she's doing done a lot of research in AI and how it will actually impact on learning and improving learning using AI. So I was quite taken with her approach and what she's doing, so I've subscribed to her newsletter. So that's Philippa Hardman. Um, but it, there's so many strong shoulders to stand on, you know, in terms of people in L&D. Um, I, I think there aren't enough of us perhaps talking about performance and learning transfer and those kind of things. There's, and, and, and in terms of stateside, there's, there's yourself, there's people like Will Talheimer, um, Bob and Con at Apply Synergies, um, Gary Wise I've mentioned, Kathy Moore, um, you know, I've met some of them and know some of them by reputation, Patty Shank. So I think there's some really good, good, good people there. Um, again, there's some here in the UK. Laura Overton has done a lot of research and work in that area. People like Robin Hoyle always talk good sense uh, and so on. So, yeah, there's, there's a bunch of really good people around that are, are worth following. Well, thank you for uh, naming those names, because I think that's helpful for others who, you know, need to be uh, set off in the right direction rather than just any direction and, uh, you know, see what happens. Uh, my final question to you is, do you have any parting words of wisdom or guidance for our audience, especially those who are new to the field, related to all things performance improvement wise? Well, performance improvement will come through people doing things differently or doing different things. And that's a phrase I've borrowed from Robin Hoyle, by the way, that's his, he originated that one. I think that's a great way to describe the desired output from learning, um, unless it's compliance or some other thing that's, so if you're looking for performance improvement, and then there's got to be a realization that in order for people to do things differently, they're going to have to behave differently and bring to bear skills that they perhaps don't yet have. So that means there's a skills upgrade necessary uh, and that's going to take time. So it's a process, not an event. So I think that's the biggest is, is performance, improving performance is a process, not an event, I think is perhaps a, a soundbite that might be.
quite useful there. And think about that whole process of getting from A to that end point you've defined of B. But it's a bit like a sat nav. If you, there's four critical things to make a sat nav work for you. You've got to know where you are now. You've got to know where you want to be in the future at some point. Um, you need a set of step-by-step -step instructions to transit that journey from point A to point B. And you're going to follow the bloody instructions. Otherwise, you're not going to get there. And those four things are the same with a learning journey. You've got to know where you are now. You've got to have some sense of what's the current state of behaviors and what do we want to do instead of that, which takes you to where you want to be behaviorally. What's your behavioral endpoint or behavioral destination? And then you have to design a set of step-by-step -step instructions that will take some time to deliver, but will take people through the journey they have to take to get from behaviorally where they are now to behaviorally where you want them to be. And then you've got to hold them accountable for doing those instructions. Otherwise, they're not going to manage to make the journey unscathed. So it's the same four things. Well, very and you can expand that metaphor into all sorts of ways. I think it's a great metaphor for getting clarity on your endpoint and then having comfort that you've got to you know, design a journey to get from A to B. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, and I, uh, those, are, those are good uh, pointers and a good four-step uh, process for people to think about as they make their own transition from wherever they are into doing better instruction or learning and or going beyond that to do performance improvement. Paul, thank you so much for sharing with us today. Um, I wish you a great day and great success, and I look forward to continuing to follow you. Thank you. No, it's been great to be here. And um, if anybody has any questions, um, you said you'd put some stuff in the show notes, but yeah, just link up on LinkedIn. I'd be happy to respond and, and always happy to talk about L&D with people. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.